So this is the most recent book from uh, Harvard University Press by Professor Finkelman. Uh, I would talk about some of his other things. It's been cited by the Supreme Court of the United States. He's written several hundred articles at this point, maybe a thousand, I don't know. Uh, but but his, his uh, scholarship has been cited by the Supreme Court. And uh, just, just to throw in for, for a little bit of color, uh, very early in his career, he took on Robert Berger. Does anyone know who that is? No, oh, nobody knows. Mm -hmm. so, but Raul Berger was one of the uh, legal academics who had disputed the Supreme Court jurisprudence for civil rights uh, and had done so on an originalist argument. And Paul Finkelman was one of the first historians to step in and kind of deliver punches uh, from the history side of things for that. And then later, he takes on Roy Moore, uh, a name we might be familiar with yet again, when he put up the gigantic Ten Commandments monument uh, on the courthouse steps. So he's kind of all over the place. Yeah. But he's here to talk to us about the pro-slavery constitution. So without further ado, please welcome Paul Finkelman. Thank you. Uh, so a couple of things. First of all, what, what, what Rob did not say, which is even more important, is that I also edited a book series at Ohio University Press. And one of the books in my series is by some guy named H. Robert Baker. Um, so I have actually been this guy's editor. He's a real pain in the butt to me. Uh, it worked out okay. Right, you what? didn't talk about very long baseball. I did not. And the other thing is, is you will uh, meet Steve Middleton later today, and his book is also in my series. So I, I, I collect these people and, and, and exploit them and profit from them. <laughs> the, the, um, Grand total of royalties I've gotten from Rob's book. Uh, I think so, I'll buy a six pack of the podium. podium. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, that, that's the nature of academic books. So, um, a couple other things. First, I want to pick up my tie. Uh, these are the people who ended slavery. Paul, we're going to stop you right there. Oh, good. Oh, okay. I apologize, everybody. We're at the tie. You could stop right Is this at the live mic or just my short time? Uh, it's a little bit of Okay. Good. All right. But we'll probably turn it down. Yeah, turn it down a little. So anyway, so my tie hat, uh, since this is a, an institute on slavery, these are the people who ended slavery. Uh, uh, Ulysses Grant, William Tecumseh Sherman, uh, General Sheridan, uh, and of course, General Sherman is also the great architect of urban renewal in Atlanta. Um, <laughs> uh, there are some people who think, in fact, he is the greatest urban renewal uh, uh, person for Atlanta. Anybody here actually from Atlanta? Okay, so um, you, you guys can sort that out one way or the other. Uh, the other thing to understand actually about history and, and, and all of what we're doing today in part is going to be demythologizing nonsense. The best evidence is that the Confederates burned Atlanta as they left, rather than Sherman burning it. And the reason for that was is the Confederate Army could not remove all of the military stores that were in Atlanta. So rather than allowing them to fall in the hands of the United States, uh, the Confederates burned them. Uh, later, uh, when Sherman moves east and, um, and gets to Columbia, South Carolina, the uh, retreating Confederate Army will attempt to burn the city of Columbia, South Carolina, rather than let it fall to the hands of the enemy. Uh, the, the other thing that you should know, and, and this is sort of a prelude to, you know, this is the end of the story. These guys are the end of the story. Uh, when you wake up in the middle of the night and you turn the television on, and the only thing you can find is Gone with the Wind, and you, you have to watch, uh, you know, that sort of god-awful pro-slavery, pro-Confederate uh, movie. Just keep in mind that, that, that Sherman's march to the sea, which of course begins in Vicksburg and goes into Mississippi and cuts across both Tennessee and Georgia and ultimately ends up in North Carolina. Sherman's march to the sea is the largest liberation of human beings in the history of the world until the Allies march on Berlin. Uh, Sherman's army emancipates fairly close to a million slaves. Had the army, uh, the army is about 60 miles wide. Had it been 100 miles wide, it would have emancipated a million and a half slaves. And, and so when you, when you understand the Civil War and you understand American constitutional history and the history of slavery, what you have to understand is that the end point of it is a war of human liberation. And that is what the war is about. Uh, 
Secession is about slavery. The war is about slavery, and the end result is about slavery. And everything else is secondary or tertiary or collateral to that issue. And I'm happy to talk about that and fill in details uh, as we move forward. Um, what you need to begin from that perspective is I, in, in, um, uh, in January 2011, which was uh, 150 years and one month after South Carolina seceded, I gave a talk at the University of South Carolina. I, I'm not shy. I, I'm made fearless. I may be stupid. Uh, but anyways, I gave a talk on, on the cause of secession. And I had a room of a couple hundred students in there. And I started by saying, you all need to understand that the purpose of secession is to protect slavery. The purpose of the war was to protect slavery. It is about slavery. And there, there were a number of students who looked like if they had had a rope, I would have been at the end of it uh, for saying these things in Columbia, South Carolina. This was a time when the Confederate flag still still flew. By the way, the other thing about this ties, this is my answer to Confederate monuments, which is uh, uh, patriotic generals who saved the United States uh, and, and defeated treason. Um, so when you, what, what, so, I, so I said this, and then I said, I, as they had marched into the room, I had, had a handout which was a document which you can easily find on the internet called the South Carolina Declaration of the Causes of Secession. <coughs> and there's actually a wonderful website that has the four documents from South Carolina, Florida, Texas, and Mississippi. These, these are the four secession conventions that explain why they were seceding. And I, I said to the students, I said, look, you don't have to believe me some Yankee coming down and telling you, you know, about, let's read what your ancestors said when they seceded. And we proceeded to read out loud two paragraphs from the Declaration of, the, of Causes of Secession, where they say, we are seceding because a man has been elected president who believes that slavery should be put on the road to ultimate extinction. That's why we are seceding. Uh, and, um, and the, and the looks on the faces of many of the students were kind of like when you hit a mirror with a pebble, you know, and the glass begins to crack. And they just didn't know what to do with this because many of them were native-born South Carolinians or other Southerners. They'd grown up learning about that secession was somehow about some weird thing called states' rights. And they were suddenly confronted for the first time in their lives as adults with the reality that they're, and, and many of them had, been, you know, were the descendants of Confederate soldiers. They were confronted with the reality that their ancestors went to war to preserve slavery, and they are very explicit about it. Again, if you if you want to get to this in a different way, there is another piece which is also easily available on the internet, uh, uh, known as um, the Cornerstone Speech. The cornerstone speech is given by Alexander Stevens, a native of Georgia, a congressman from Georgia who becomes the vice president of the Confederacy. And Alexander Stevens gives this speech about a month before the war begins. And in it, he says two things. Many of you know about one thing he says, but we almost don't ever talk about the other. He says that there are two reasons for the Confederacy that form the cornerstone of the Confederacy. One of them is slavery. So he says, the cornerstone of the Confederacy is slavery. But built into these paragraphs, in a rather convoluted way, he, he also says that in the North, they believe in racial equality. And we know this is wrong. And we are building a society, he says, the first society in the world with the understanding that God put black people on Earth to be slaves. So when you think about the Confederacy, it is not only about slavery, but it is a nation created on the assumption of white supremacy. And this is the hard one, and some people will be un uncomfortable with this, which is fine, because if you're not uncomfortable, I didn't do my job. <laughs> the Confederacy is the great-grandfather of Nazi Germany and apartheid South Africa because those are the only other two countries in the world that were created for the notion of racial supremacy and 
the dehumanization and the explicit statement that some people are inferior to others. And again, you know, if you teach this stuff in your classes and students get all upset and they run back to mommy and daddy and mommy and daddy come with their little confederate flag, you know, uh, lapel buttons uh, or their, you know, make the confederacy great again hacks. Uh, and, um, and they do that, give them, give them Alexander Stevens's, Stevens's cornerstone speech and say, read this. Sit in the chair and read what the Vice President of the Confederacy said. Sit in the chair and read what the Secession Convention in South Carolina says. Uh, in, in Texas, the, the Texas Convention says that we came into the Union with slavery in, our, in, in Texas. And anybody here from the great Lone Star Republic? Okay. So they say we, we came in. I, I, I was a citizen of the Republic of Texas. <laughs> You were too, yeah. Uh, and, and, and they said, they say that we came in with slavery and that slavery will exist forever in Texas. I, some of you may remember um, about 12 years ago when uh, Rick Perry was trying to get the presidential nomination and there was a debate where he said, you know, the first four things I'll do as president, you can only remember three of them. Right? And, and I always assumed the fourth one was to reinstate slavery. <laughs> because that's what Texas was created for. And, 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 um, and the only way that we as educators are going to change the world is when we begin to get Americans to understand this piece of our heritage. All right, that's this set of prefaces and the flat and the time. Next preface is we are all here for the same reason because we are all educators, we are all historians. Um, so there is no hierarchy here. Uh, I talk and you listen for a while and then you're going to ask me questions and put me on the spot and then. Uh, it'll be reversed, but there's no hierarchy here. This is not a uh, professor talking to students. This is history educators talking to each other. And I, I think, so, I, are there any people here who are not history, history teachers? So we teach? Uh, yes, and, and you? Uh, okay. Okay, so literature, it, you know, you're here because you teach literature in the form of, of, of history. Government, yeah. So it's all, in a sense, we are all in the same world. Uh, and and um, by the way, I came down here last night. I'm running my own NEH Institute in Washington this week. So I'm playing looking for my institute. Uh, and my institute uh, has people, it's a college professor institute, but in addition to historians, I have people in government and political science, I have people in literature, I have a, somebody who's a musicologist who does 19th century music. Uh, it's everywhere. You know, it's, it, you know, disciplinary lines cease to make any, any, any sense. And of course, if you are teaching about slavery, and if you're teaching about the obscenity of slavery and the way people came to oppose slavery, perhaps the single best book, except for all the ones that I wrote, <laughs> it would be the greatest novel ever written in America, which is Love Uncle Tom's Cabin. <laughs> Not the love. It's Uncle Tom's Cabin. <laughs> Uncle Tom's Cabin is the greatest American novel ever written. I, I mean, I love Moby Dick and I love Huck Finn, but if you're talking about what changed America, there are two books. There's Uncle Tom's Cabin, and then there's The Jungle. You know, and, and, and uh, of course, when I say this to literature professors, they cringe and they freak out and they say, oh, no, no, it's a terrible book. And it may be a terrible book as a literary effort, but for what it did, you know, Lincoln meets Stowe during the war and allegedly says, so you're the little lady that started this war. Well, she didn't start the war, but what she did do and we can talk about this later if you want, is encapsulate and articulate and teach people about what slavery is all about. Okay, those are, that's two prefaces. Third preface is this, and then we're gonna get into the, into the 
get it into the program. So, so the, 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 the end of the second preface is we are all in this together. We are all soldiers in the war against stupidity and ignorance. Uh, and uh, the only difference between your career and mine is you have much harder jobs than I ever had because you're out there on the front lines, you're in the trenches. And as a new college professor, I was always kind of in the back you know, providing you with the ammunition, but you're the ones out there shooting the ammunition. So I am here to be your provider of ammunition, and that is for not just this seminar, but for the rest of your careers or the rest of my life, whichever is shorter. Um, <laughs> and so I'm going to give you two email addresses right now. Okay. The first one is my permanent email address, assuming that anything is permanent, uh, and that is P A U L dot F-I-N-K-E-L-M-A-N, which is my name, at yahoo.com. And the other is my current professional address, uh, which of course will change when eventually I leave this job. That's why it's not the permanent one. And that is president at G-R-A-T-Z, which is Gratz, Gratz College, dot edu. So president at Gratz.edu. Uh, I now want to say some, pardon? G-R-A-T-Z, which is Gratz College, so president at Gratz.edu. I want to say something about Gratz College. Uh, this is a new job for me. I've been a classroom teacher my whole life. Um, last year, the, the, uh, a member of the board of Gratz College asked me if I would want to be considered for the presidency, and I asked them what they were smoking. And so, <laughs> and so I have some, would they share? Um, you know, we could go to Colorado where it would be legal. And, um, and they said, no, we really need somebody who's a scholar to run the college. Uh, we're, we're tired of bureaucrats. And uh, I thought that was a positive statement. You know, so I ended up becoming president. Uh, I wake up every day both exhilarated and wondering, what am I doing and why? But I'm there. What I want to tell you about this, Gratz is a very small college in Philadelphia. But virtually all of our teaching is done online. We have about six MAED programs, which you can do online. So for those of you who are in the stage of your career where you need to get another degree, or you need to get 30 hours past your last degree, you can do it from your living room at grass. You can do it in a variety of subjects, in, a different, in addition to the MAED program. By the way, when you raise your hand, I'll probably acknowledge you by pointing or something, meaning I'll get to you as soon as, as, soon as I finish what I'm thinking, because if I stop, I won't remember where I was. Um, in addition to the MAED, we also have a, an EDD. So if there are those of you who are saying, OK, I'm now teaching, I now want to go up the next step to be, you know, to run a school or uh, be a district supervisor or something, you need to get a doctor. You can get an, N you can get an EDD in uh, educational leadership. We also have an MA in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. And, and there are a number of states now that require teaching Holocaust in the schools, so this is a this is an opportunity to, to get the MA in that. And we now just started in, in last fall a PhD in genocide and Holocaust studies. Um, I was out in uh, New Mexico um, earlier this year, and I was at a, a meeting of uh, something called Colt, which is the Coalition of Large Tribes. Anybody here from the Southwest or the the, the Mountain West? So the, these are the these are the uh, I think the ten biggest tribes in the country, uh, starting with the Navajo Nation. Uh, the Navajo Nation geographically is basically uh, kind of the size of New Jersey. I mean, it is just unbelievably big. And so this was a coalition of large tribes. And and one of the um, I was talking to one of the uh, tribal leaders. Some of them are chief, called chiefs. Some of them are president. They're all elected now. So this was one of the tribal chiefs. And I said, so we have this Holocaust and Genocide Studies program. And he kind of aggressively said, so you teach about my people. And I pulled that back my uh, Navajo bracelet that I wear. And I said, absolutely. Uh, we have whole courses on American Indians uh, and, and genocide. And his whole demeanor changed. So it, it, is, uh, it, it is possible for any of you, if you want to do other things 
in your life, this is the way to do it. One of our, to give you an idea, one of our PhD students is a retired Army colonel who teaches at the Army Command College at Fort Leavenworth. He is the guy who teaches new, newly promoted majors because they go to ma essentially it's major school and sub lieutenant colonel school. He is getting a PhD in Holocaust because he says he had been a combat officer in three wars where there was where there was genocide. And we're not talking about World War II. We're talking about Bosnia and Iraq and Rwanda and other places all over the world. So so that's the problem. You had a question. I did. Is that PhD program in Holocaust and genocide studies online as well? It is completely online. Wow. Uh, you have a one week uh, uh, there's a one week summer program in, in in house and everything else is online. Um, and here's the great beauty of it. We do not require a GRE exam to uh, apply, <laughs> which, which I think is, uh, you know, pr probably the best benefit to people because who wants to take a test at our age, right? <laughs> and why should? Okay. Any other qu any questions about it? Yes. Do you have recommended something? Well, we don't have curriculum units. We have courses. Yeah, and by the way, you could take one course. You could say, look, I want to take your course on genocide and, and Native Americans. And, and you can simply enroll for a single course. Uh, and it, but, but again, it, it, I mean, one of the things that's, that's different, and this is something to think about, if you go to an, an MAED or if you go to an ed program, then it tends to be curriculum and uh, pedagogy based, right? If you go to the MA in Holocaust or the PhD in Holocaust, it is not curriculum based, it is not pedagogical based, it's scholarship based. So our students will write dissertations, which will then be hopefully published as books. And it is a very different process, but for the MA, we have lots of public school teachers. I mean, one of, again, one of our teachers, one, one of the people in our MA program teaches on the Flathead Reservation in Montana. And, um, uh, you know, there are high school teachers who take the MA program from all over the country and actually from outside the United States. Uh, I just returned from, from nine days in Poland and uh, I'm hoping to develop at least a course that is partially taught at Auschwitz. So you will be sitting in your living room and you will be doing a uh, doing work uh, I mean, with with the education department in Auschwitz. So that's the future. So that's what I do. In addition, as Rob said, I, I have published more books than, than normal human beings should. Um, according to Amazon, I've published like 75 books, but that's not really true because Amazon lies. <laughs> oh my God, the internet lies. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, but I have been the author, editor, or co-editor of about 50 books and about 200 scholarly articles. Supreme Court has cited me four times, and I was the expert witness against Roy Moore's Ten Commandments in Alabama. I, I proudly say that I helped bring Roy down the first time. Um, <laughs> and of course, then he was, and he was kicked off the court and he refused a direct order of a federal judge to remove his monument. He then got reelected, and the court was kicked off a second time when uh, he refused to uh, follow Supreme Court precedent on marriage equality. And then finally, the voters of Alabama took him down probably for the last time um, in, the, in, the, in the special election. Um, I was also the expert witness in the lawsuit over who owned Barry Bonds' 73 home run ball because I was the only scholar in the world who'd ever written an article on why you own a baseball if you catch it. If you think about it, if you're in a basketball game, the ball bounces into the stands, you don't get to keep it. Football, you don't get to keep it, so why a baseball? So I actually written a scholarly article on this. Um, and, and, and this, of course, leads to the final twist in, in, in scholars write about weird stuff. And, we write, and, and often, you know, you'll, you'll get, especially in, in some states, you'll get some state legislator, you know, say, you know, Professor Jones writes about the sex life of mosquitoes, you know, uh, blah, blah, blah. And of course, then it, it comes out two years later. And there was actually a, an, an incidence of this uh, where some, some um, politician was complaining that some professor was exploring the sex life of some insect. You know, this was like, oh my God, you know, 
because you shouldn't have sex with insects, only with porn stars. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> it turns out, of course, as you would all guess, that when you study the sex lives of, of insects that are bad for crops, you can figure out how, how to eradicate the insects without pesticides. Because you can fool them into having, into having sex with, with, uh, with infertile um, partners. And, and so, in fact, what we do as scholars sometimes seems completely irrelevant until suddenly it becomes very relevant. All right, enough of me. Let's talk about slavery in the Constitution. First, any questions about everything I've just said? Because I've just laid a lot of stuff on you all at once. Uh, I'm happy to talk to you individually or online about any of these, including uh, you know, the graduate programs in my school. All right, so let's turn to the Constitution. And um, how long how long do, are we on this morning, today, this afternoon? Pardon? What? No, just joking. Um, we got about an hour, an hour and a half. An hour and a half. Okay, fine. So about 3.30? Yeah. All right, okay, so I, I want to start not with the Constitution, but I want to back this up a great deal. And the first place to start is with the understanding that slavery is the most ubiquitous social institution in the history of human beings with the exception of marriage. That is, uh, there is almost no society in the world that has not had slavery at some point. The great sociologist at Harvard, Orlando Patterson, says in one of his books that virtually everybody on earth today is the descendant of a slave or a slave owner. I would say probably almost everybody on earth is the descendant of both, a slave and a slave owner, if you can go back far enough. Uh, there is no ancient society that does not have slavery. Uh, Babylonia, Assyria, Egypt, everywhere there is slavery. Rome, Greece. If we could drop into the Mediterranean world of, say, the year 800, post-Roman Empire, we would find that the entire Mediterranean Sea is just one big slave-holding lake. There is slavery on both sides, or, or the year 900. There's slavery on both sides. Um, there are slaves of every known race, religion, and ethnicity. There is no limitation on who could be a slave. Uh, the, the word slave, anybody know where the word slave comes from? Slav. Slav. And why does it come from the word slavs? Okay. <laughs> exactly. Because if we could trans magically transport ourselves back to, say, Athens in the year 1000 or 900, we would see a bunch of blue-eyed blonde folks carrying heavy burdens and doing all the dirty work. And we'd say, who are those? And they'd say, oh, they're the Slavs. They're the slaves. Who are the great slave traders of the period? How did these, sla these Slavs get to Greece so they could become slaves, they're brought by the Vikings. And so the Vikings coming out of what's Sweden, Norway, cross into uh, the lower Baltic, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Ukraine, fill up their ships with people they've captured, sail out into the Atlantic, probably stop in, in, in Ireland or Scotland and pick up some more people if they have space on their ships and end up selling them in the, new, in, in the Mediterranean. In addition, there's a very large overland slave trade from what is today Ukraine and Russia down through modern Bulgaria, Romania, and into the Mediterranean region. So the Slavic peoples are the great source of slavery on the northern rim of the Mediterranean. And the word Slav morphs into the word slave and the word slave appears in the English language sometime, I think, in the late, late 900s or early 1000s. You begin to get the word slave in what would then be Old English. And that's the, the history. In Rome, of course, the people were not slaves. The, the term is servius, which means somebody who serves. But again, if you see, think about the French, the French word for slavery is esclavage. Again, the Slav is there. Um, so that becomes the source. 
Now, on the southern rim of the Mediterranean, you would have found um, the Muslim North Africa, which is, again, just one big giant slave market from, from one end of the, uh, of the Muslim world to the other. Uh, the source of slaves would have been Bedouins and other people who were not Muslim yet who had not converted to Islam as well as increasingly large numbers of black Africans, sub-Saharan Africans, who are brought across the Sahara by North Africans who cross the Sahara, raid villages, rip off people, and bring them up to the Mediterranean. If we went to the middle of Africa, sub-Saharan Africa in the year 1000, we would have found slaves in every single culture of Africa. Everywhere you would have found slaves. You would have found slaves in India, China, Russia, you name it. In fact, the only two places in the world where there has never been slavery were among the Inuit peoples or the Eskimo peoples of the Arctic Circle and the Ab Australian Aboriginals. And the reason for that is because in both societies, uh, the food supply is so scarce that there's no value to a slave. And somebody who might have been enslaved in another culture I'll get to the why you would be enslaved. That person would simply have been eaten in those cultures um, because they're a good source of protein. Okay, so um, you know, if you don't have a strong stomach, you better leave that because it doesn't get better. Okay. Uh, now, how do you become a slave? Well, there. Are, three or four sort of classic ways you become slaves. From the ancient world until at least the 1500s in Europe, the general rule of warfare is that you are permitted to kill anyone you capture in battle. So at the end of the battle, I have my sword to this enemy soldier's throat and I say, would you like to die or would you like to come back to Rome and be my slave? And he says, okay, I'd rather be a slave than dead. And so capture in battle is a classic way of becoming a slave. In addition, in the ancient world, the rule of war is that if you surround a city and ask the city to surrender, and it does not, then when you capture the city, you can enslave all of its inhabitants. So men, women, and children are either slaughtered or enslaved. Uh, when, when the enemy captures your city. So that's the first thing, warfare. Second thing is debt. I am in debt, I owe you money, I don't have any money, but I do have a son or a daughter, and so I give you my son or my daughter, and they become your slave for life. And this is very common in, in the Roman world. You simply, children are a commodity. Uh, you know, for people who think that, that Human trafficking is something new. It's been going on from the very beginning of time. And so I give my child away. Um, under Roman law, it's not permissible to uh, sell your wife into slavery. Uh, it is permissible to kill her uh, for adultery or various other things, but you can't sell her into slavery. However, in other cultures, you could sell your wife into slavery. There are examples in Rome of people who have nothing else, and so they sell themselves into slavery to pay their debts. So debt becomes a method of enslavement. A third method of enslavement is criminal behavior. You are sentenced to enslavement. Remember, they don't have prisons, they don't have penitentiaries. Uh, and so uh, punishment of people is either death, capital punishment, uh, physical punishment, beating, whipping, maiming, torture, fines, or enslavement. Uh, and of course, the final one, the one that we're perhaps most familiar with, is you are a slave because your mother was a slave. And so slavery becomes the status of people whose mothers are slaves. Now, in some cultures, if your mother is a slave and your father is a free person, then you are born free. But in, Ro in the Roman world, which is the origin of the law of slavery for what becomes the whole new world, it is natural lineal. And the natural lineal notion of, of, of the child following the status of mother comes from the law of animals. Okay? Think about this. Any of you are uh, uh, horse breeders or dog breeders? 
know, the, the, the common thing is, is you have a, a prize dog, somebody else wants to breed your dog with their female dog, and so the, the owner of the female dog gets all the babies, and you pay a stud fee for the dog or the horse or, or, or a bull in, in the cattle world. So, so, in other words, the owner of the female animal owns the offspring of the female animal, so the owner of a female slave owns the offspring of the female slave. Um, and this is, of course, completely common in the Roman world, and this becomes the American rule uh, at least as early as the 1660s. Now, again, you should understand that in England, the status of the child follows the father, okay? So if your father is a nobleman and your mother is the chambermaid who is not married to a nobleman, then you are quite literally a noble bastard. You're still a bastard, but you inherit your father's noble, noble status, even though even though you're you're a bastard child. Uh, yes. Isn't that where the name Fitzroy comes from? Is the bastards were generally royal bastards were generally named Fitzroy as a a surname? I do not know that. That, that might be true. Um, uh, Roy, of course, would be uh, a, a derivation of, of royalty, of the king. In the Spanish rey, which is the king, which is the king, the king's name. So it's entirely possible that Fitzroy means son of the king and therefore son of, you know, a, a bastard child of royalty and nobility. That's interesting. I didn't know that, but why not? Uh, so, any questions other than, than this? All right, now, who is enslavable? Well, as I've just suggested, pretty much anybody's enslavable. Uh, uh, let me give you the best example of enslavability from a text that probably everybody here is at least marginally familiar with. The book of Genesis tells us the story of Joseph, right? Joseph, the guy with the coat of many colors. Joseph is the spoiled brat son of Jacob. Jacob is a very prosperous herdsman. He has many cat, many sheep, many goats, many sons. He has a dozen sons. And Joseph is his, his the youngest son, uh, born of his favorite wife. Uh, Joseph has children with two wives and at least two concubines, um, or handmaidens as they're, they're called in the relatively poor uh, King James translation of the Bible. Uh, and uh, so the, um, and, and the brothers of Joseph, of course, just hate him. And the Bible says they, they could not even speak civilly to him. And he's obnoxious. He says, I had a dream where one day all you guys would bow down to me. Well, that's a really great way to make your older brothers like you, right? And finally, they get completely sick and tired of this. And what do they do? They fake his death. They pour sheep's blood on his clothing, and they sell him to a caravan of Ishmaelites that are going to, I think it's Ishmaelites, uh, that are they're on their way to Egypt. And so Joseph goes to Egypt. Nobody in this, and then Joseph is sold into Egypt. Okay, nobody in this story ever questions the status of Joseph as a slave, right? The, uh, the people who find him, who buy him, See him, he's in a pit, he no longer has his nice coat on, he's been roughed up, he's tied up, and they say, hey, we have a slave, you want to buy him? And, and Joseph's not in a position, wait, 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 I'm the, I'm the spoiled son of a rich guy. No, you know, no, he's a slave, he gets to Egypt, he's a slave. No one ever doubts his slave status. And so when you think about slavery, you realize that slavery is about the alteration of a human being's status to turn them from a free person into somebody who has owned his property. And the fundamental status of slaves is always that they are property. They can be bought, they can be sold, they can be bequeathed, they can be gifted, they can be seized by the sheriff for debt. There is a there is one case in the in the antebellum south where where a free black man 
marries a slave woman, but he can't free her because the laws don't allow her to be free, so he technically owns his wife, and he goes into debt, and the sheriff seizes his only asset, which is his wife, and sells her at auction to pay the man's debts. Uh, perfectly legal, because that's the system that American slavery creates. Okay. Now, slavery varies greatly from culture to culture. So that in ancient Rome, you, or Greece, you have slaves who are doctors, who are philosophers, who are mathematicians, who are considered to be respected members of their community. Uh, in Egypt, there is an entire huge community of slaves known as Malamuks, who, are, who actually are the, the mainstay of, of the Egyptian army uh, in, in, say, the 1200s. But they are all slaves, which means that despite whatever status they have, tomorrow they can be sold. In Rome, a slave owner may kill his slave for any reason or no reason at all. So no matter, you know, my slave is the, is the best doctor in town, and I decide I'm tired of him, I can just kill him tomorrow because he, is, he has no status as a human being. If I kill your slave in Rome, you can sue me for the value of the slave, but it's not a crime. It's a, it's a property trespass, okay? So anywhere you go, this is the universal situation. Now, the treatment of slaves varies dramatically across cultures and within cultures. So that if you are the, um, the pampered slave of a well-to-do slave owner, you may have materially a pretty good life. You may have a nice place to sleep, you may have good food, you may dress well, but you also know that on any given day, this can change like this, because tomorrow your owner can go into debt and you are sold. Again, if you go back to Uncle Tom's Cabin, you, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with the book, but one of the pieces of the book is that Uncle, Tom's cat, Uncle Tom is the favorite slave of a man named Mr. Shelby, and everybody loves Uncle Tom, and Uncle Tom is kind of the leader of the slave community on this plantation. And Mr. Shelby goes into debt, he, I think he's a gambler, and a slave trader buys his debts and comes to him and says, I'm here to collect the debts, and Tom and Eliza are the two slaves I'm taking from your plantation to pay the debt. And so one day Tom is the favorite slave of the Shelby family, and everybody loves Tom, and the next day Tom is in chains going down the Mississippi River. Uh, that is the status of slaves. Your families have no value. You do not have parental rights to your children. You raise your children. You love your children. You love your spouse. But your marriage is never legal. No slave is legally married to somebody else because a marriage is a contract, right? Slaves can't sign contracts, so they cannot be legally married. Um, in the late antebellum period, uh, as you will see, and because tomorrow we'll talk about pro-slavery thought, and one of the um, what one of the articles in here is about. Uh, is the Protestant Episcopal Convention of South Carolina the duty of clergy in relation to the marriage of slaves? Because Southern ministers are extremely perplexed by what you do with slave marriages because they think all slaves should have a marriage by a minister. You should call the minister in. They should be married according to Christian marriage rights. And yet at the same time, they all know that these marriages can be broken up whenever a slave is sold. And so what is the answer? Ultimately, the answer of every single Southern minister is the same. Of course, you should bring a minister. Of course, the minister didn't get paid, so maybe there's a little self-healing here. But nevertheless, of course, you should have a minister solemnize the marriage. But when the slaves are sold, that the church should view the sale of marriage partners as the equivalent of either a legal divorce, if it's a, if it's a faith which allows divorce, or as the death of the spouse so that they can remarry when they go to their next place and it won't be considered adultery. Okay? Uh, in his 
only book he ever writes, Notes on the State of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson talks about slave marriages, and he, he says that slaves don't love people, love each other the, the way whites love each other. He says their, their, their love is not the tender, tender mix of emotion and feelings. He says rather it's all about lust. Uh, and, um, and he says the, the proof of this is that when their marriages end, they remarry somebody else without much thought. Now, Thomas Jefferson is writing notes in the state of Virginia in the wake of his wife dying, and Jefferson will never remarry, and allegedly he tells his wife on her deathbed that, don't worry, I will never take another wife, which is really uncommon at the time. It's a world where, where people who survive spouses always get remarried. Thomas doesn't get remarried. Instead, he simply, um, a decade later, um, begins a lifelong relationship with his slave, Sally Hemings, um, and, of course, Sally Hemings is the half-sister of his late wife because his wife's father, a man named John Wales, has a family with Mrs. Wales and a family with Betty Hemings. So when Thomas Jefferson takes up with Sally Hemings, he's probably taking up with somebody who looks a lot like his late wife because they share a father. Um, and so, uh, so, so, so that's the... So again, another piece of slavery is always that if you own the slave, you own the body of the slave. And so one of the differences between all labor relations and slavery is this, that your school board has you under contract for the time that you are in the school. But when you leave school and go home, the school board does not own your time. They do not own you. And the school board does not own your body, although I'm sure some of you have principles who think otherwise uh, in, in very weird ways. But, but nevertheless, the slave owner literally owns the body of the slave, and therefore, 24-7, the slave is available. Finally, a piece of this puzzle, then I'll get to your question, and then we'll move, we'll be able to go to the Constitution. Under American slave law, the status of a child is determined by the mother. So if the mother is a slave, the child is a slave. That's the first principle. Now, what does this mean for Southern society for the next 250 years, or 200 years from the 1660s? In the 1860s. Well, what it means is this, that in a society where out of wedlock uh, pregnancy leads to significant issues for the father and mother, that is, if you are the father of a woman who's pregnant in colonial Virginia, the, 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 the minister and a, a government official called the overseer of the poor is probably going to come to you and they're going to say, hey, Johnny, uh, Mary says she's having your baby. Is that true? And Johnny said, uh, come on, Johnny. Tell okay, yeah, she's going to have my baby. Well, don't you think you ought to marry? Mary? And Johnny says, yeah, we'll get around to it. Well, you know, we have to have the minister right here. And Mary's right here. So let's do it right now. And you're going to get married to Mary or you're going to go to jail for the crime of basketball. Okay? Unless Mary's black and a slave, because then there's no crime, and the master doesn't care that Mary's pregnant because the master's going to have another slave. So one of the consequences, and this is something again to think about, is that the law of slavery sets up a system where black women in America are subject to the sexual desires of men, white and black, with no consequences to the men, at least for the legal system. You know, there may be consequences from your wife if you're having sex with slaves. Women. Although the diaries of southern slave, uh, southern white women are filled with complaints about what their husbands and their brothers and their fathers and their sons do, but they can't do anything about it. So that's one set of principles that come out. Second set of principles that come out of slavery is that no slave can ever testify against a free person, and in most of the South, no 
black can ever testify against a white person. And therefore, if you commit a crime against a slave, there is no punishment unless there are white witnesses to the crime if you are a white person. So that uh, can a master murder his own slave? The answer is no, it's a crime to murder your slave. How do you prove the murder of a slave if there are no white witnesses? Because none of the slave witnesses can 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 step forward. Uh, to give you a, 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 a very famous example, Thomas Jefferson has two nephews uh, who live in Kentucky. Uh, they are single men. They live together. They own you know 20 or so slaves. And uh, one day they both get rip roaring drunk and they call all the slaves into the great room of their house. And they proceed to take a 12-year-old boy and chop him up with an ax until he finally dies. They chop off his hands, his feet, his legs. Finally, he dies. Uh, and all the slaves have to watch this. And then they take the remains of this young boy, and they put him in the fireplace, and they burn him up. And the world finds out about this because dogs in the neighborhood are running around with human body parts, which leads to a coroner's inquest. And the coroner's inquest, of course, can ask the slaves because you can testify at inquest. You can't testify in court. So the slaves all say the same story. Everybody knows what happens. And uh, these are the Aishan brothers. And the Aishan brothers, of course, cannot be prosecuted because there is no witness to the crime who can testify against them. Uh, there are a small number of cases in which whites are executed for murdering slaves. There's one famous case in North Carolina where a man named John Hoover was executed for murdering his own slave. And the reason for that is because so many white witnesses watched and abused her in such horrible ways. And so the white witness testimony about his temper and his abuse combined with the coroner's report on the cause of death led a jury to convict him. And we actually have his warrant for execution. And we also have found uh, the newspaper story uh, where his uh, will is being pro his estate is being probated uh, a, a month later. So he is in fact executed. So there are a few examples of that. There are very, very few. Uh, in Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harriet Beecher Stowe, of course, writes about Simon Legree, who, who murders slaves. And after she writes the book, uh, she is viciously attacked in the South for these lies. And she writes another book, which I recommend to all of you, called the Key to, A Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin, where she has all of the empirical data to justify everything she said. And one of the empirical pieces of empirical data is um, uh, the the case of a man in Virginia who is ultimately sentenced to five years in jail for, for the manslaughter of a slave uh, because the jury decides not to, to convict him of first-degree first murder. And he appeals to the Virginia Supreme Court. And the Virginia Supreme Court, hardly a pro-black, hardly an anti-slavery group of people, they say our only regret is that we cannot raise the punishment from five years in jail to execution because you deserve to die, and you should be happy you're only going to be five years. So there are examples of this, but they are very, very few, because generally, crimes against slaves are all the Now, the, there are a number of scholars, including economists, who say, well, torturing slaves, murdering slaves is very rare, because after all, who would destroy $1,000 worth of property? I remember having lunch with an economist who told me that. And I said, well, have you ever seen somebody drive a, a $50,000 Cadillac into a tree? And he said, well, only when they're drunk. And I said, so? Uh, <laughs> and then, then I, and I said, have you ever seen somebody slam the front door so hard that the window breaks? And he says, yeah. And I said, so what's it like to come home from a really hard day and just have somebody you can beat the crap out of to get it out of your system? And being an economist, he got really excited and said, oh, I have to figure out some economic value for the pleasure you get from being slaves. So, oh, so he went off to, 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 to explore this. But this is all the nature of slavery. All right. There are a couple of hands I waved away at the view and then you. My question was actually, um, what time period did Thomas Jefferson actually have that opinion? And did, I assume it was before he had a relation to Sally? Yes. 
So he writes notes on the state of Virginia in 1784. He probably begins his relationship with Sally sometime around either 1788 or 89, or sometime a little later in the early 1790s. We do not know exactly. So it's not that far distant. So is there any is there any writings to suggest he may have Changed his mind or changed his. Oh no, about. no. In fact, he, in fact, his subsequent writings are um, uh, are 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 persistent about his obsession with interracial sex and his fear that if you end slavery, all of these slaves are going to chase after our women. Uh, oh, so and he's, he's writing this at the time that, of course, he's having a lifetime relationship with Sally. Um, if any of you want to read more about this. I have another book, you're used to this phrase, uh, called uh, Slavery and the Founders. Uh, the subtitle is uh, Race and Liberty in the Age of Jefferson. And I have two very long chapters on Jefferson and slavery, and it's all set out in great detail. Uh, you had a question there. I never knew that. Thanks. Well, the brothers are going to find the chapters. We've got to find the spell the name. There is a book by a man named Boynton, B-O-Y-N-T-O-N, called Jefferson's Nephews. Uh, it's, a, it's an old book. It's probably it was published 50 years ago. Hey, pardon? Yeah, and, and the book is called Jefferson's Nephews, uh, and, and it's all detailed there. Yes? I had a question on what you were talking about property. We uh, had to read this book by a plain Austin. Yeah. Uh, Let me, that's a, a, let me hold that answer. Are there any other hands? Well, I was just going to add that there's another book by Nathan Reed that is in the Marcello. Yeah. yeah. And, and, that's, and that has this huge book on the whole Hemings family, which is a huge family. Uh, I will say that Annette is a former classmate of mine. We are very old friends. We disagree quite dramatically on the one central issue. That is for reasons that I do not understand, but she explains. Um, she believes that the relationship with Jefferson and Sally was uh, consensual and romantic. And uh, I believe that there is simply no evidence to prove that or support it. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest otherwise, but we cannot know. Um, and, uh, and, and I can make a strong case why 17-year-old Sally Hennings would be enamored with tall, handsome, powerful, rich Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and I can also make an argument that, that while Sally may, be, be, may have been smitten by Thomas, uh, Thomas never does anything in his life to suggest that he cares very much about what happens to her at all, to the point in his will when he frees the last remaining child of Sally that is not free, and he free, frees three of four of Sally's brothers. He does not free Sally in his will. Uh, but it's a it, other than this disagreement about motivation. Uh, you know, uh, Annette's book won the Pulitzer Prize, and it's a great book. Oh, he, he, she gives evidence. Pardon? She, she gives evidence of the love relationship. He talks about the silks that he buys for her in France, and the fact that. He paid for her to be inoculated, and that was a very expensive ordeal. I mean, she doesn't see Yeah, and, 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 and my answer would be, if you're Thomas Jefferson, you have all your slaves inoculated, because they're valuable. And, 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 and of course you dress your mistress in silk, because it feels good, and she looks good. I, I, I'm sorry, you know, if, if uh, you know, if, I, I mean, I would, simply, I would simply use the phrase, a man is not a plan. And, and for and for you know, giving Sally Hemings nice clothing, um, it, 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 slave masters all throughout history dress their favorite slaves in expensive clothing. Uh, in England in the 1750s and 60s, 
if you went to the house of a wealthy nobleman or a wealthy businessman, you would probably find black slaves brought over from the Caribbean working in that household. They would be immaculately dressed. They would be in the best clothing, because after all, you want to put your best foot forward with these people. Uh, doesn't mean you love them. That, 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 would, be, that would be my response. Um, in addition to, it's a sign of status mm -hmm. for slaves to be well-dressed. To have a well-dressed slave group means you have status not only you can afford to pay for them to be well-dressed, I can still maintain my house. But also, um, I don't know in the case of Southerners, but in, there were cases that I've been reading about where you would um, you want to dress your slaves so nobody would mistakenly try to free them when they go across the ocean. Because if she looks like a slave, then people, especially in like England, they would try to free her. And they didn't want that. So there, are, there are lots of reasons for clothing. You had a hand. I mean, how is this even a discussion in terms of the power dynamic between a slave master <coughs> and a 17 year old slave? It's like saying, you know, I mean, it's like talk about the on the job sexual harassment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. Exactly. It's on the job sexual harassment <laughs> when there's no rules against it. Yeah. And, and so, and so my, now, I, I will tell you. That when you get into when you get into the details of slavery, and when you get into the, the world of slavery, you discover relationships between slaves and masters that are, by every indication, loving, caring relations. I will give you one example, and then I want to move on to the Constitution because you you raise the question that's going to bring me into that. Okay, uh, there is a master in. in Mississippi, whose name is Mitchell. And Mitchell, Mr. Mitchell has a child with one of his slaves. And late in life, he takes his slave mistress to Indiana and buys her a farm and formally frees her. He takes his slave daughter to Ohio and formally frees her under Ohio law. He then goes back to Mississippi and he is ill probably from tuberculosis, which would be the common killer at the time. And his daughter, Nancy, goes back to Mississippi and nurses her father in the last two years of his life at risk to herself because it's illegal for a free black to go to Mississippi. She goes black to, back to Mississippi, takes care of her father, nurses her father, when he dies, she goes back to Ohio, and in his will, he leaves Nancy his bed, which is a, of course, a, not the mattress, but the, the bed frame, you know, the, the pillared bed, the brass bed, whatever it is. It's a very personal gift. His pocket watch, which is a very personal gift, and $3,000, which is a hell of a lot of money in those days. That, I think, is an example of a slave relationship with a master that is loving to the point where Nancy is willing to risk her own freedom to go and take care of her father. Now, he has other slaves. He doesn't treat them as He treats this particular slave and her child, his child, that way. There is another case in Mississippi where a master dies and he wills that his two slave sons be free and get property. And there's a, a fight because the heirs, of course, want the property and the slaves for themselves. And the, and the testimony is from all of the neighbors that this guy always referred to their mother as the woman that he loved and that he would marry if he could, and that these are his sons, and he never, he always acknowledged them as his sons, he raised them as his sons. And they all said he's an idiot, he's a fool, he's a crazy man, but that's okay because, you know, slave owners can do what they want with their sons. So there are examples where you can actually see what are within the constraints of a strange world love relationships. I don't think a silk dress does it, but we could be wrong. Uh, I, 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 I would reiterate Marissa's point, because I, I read the Hens of Monticello and it transformed my understanding of, well, it gave voice to the voiceless, right? Because we mm -hmm. don't have a lot of written documents of um, what slave life was like, and so she meticulously went through the records of his plantation. I, I think it's a fabulous book. I'm just saying that I don't buy that piece of it. But, you know, that's not our agenda here, so I want to, 
Uh, I want to I move on. Uh, you know, and, and I would say go read her work because she's a great historian. And, um, okay, now, your question gets to the Constitution. So let me slip up, let me flip over to the Constitution here and, and talk a little bit about slavery in the United States leading up to the Constitution. So, on the eve of the American Revolution, you have 13 British colonies from what is today Maine to Georgia. Slavery is legal in every single one of these colonies. There are slaves in every single one of these colonies. There are slave owners in every single one of these colonies. Uh, by and large, most Americans accept slavery as a fact, as a reality, as a component of their world. If you imagine the entire British world where there is a king on top, and at least in theory, although no longer in practice, at the bottom are serfs who are not slaves, but serfs were people who were tied to the land where they lived, so they had, you know, relative, they had limited freedom. And if you imagine the whole hierarchy of, of English society, the creation of slavery in the late 17th century simply adds one more status on the bottom of the hierarchy to the British hierarchy of king to serf and now king to slave. And by the way, in this same 100 year period, there are other statuses because, because sort of urban businessmen, wealthy businessmen who are, not, uh, who, who are not nobility, also sort of come in so you, you have a class of very wealthy people living in London. They're not noblemen, but they're richer than many noblemen. And so they are creating, so you have a, a class stratified society. America is a class stratified place. In America, you would find a smattering of people who oppose slavery. Quakers, Mennonites, other members of pietistic faiths, of which there are relatively few, have by the 1750s come to the conclusion that slavery violates the law of God. Methodists, Found in the Methodist faith founded by John Wesley is anti-slavery. John Wesley initially uh, prohibits slave owners from becoming Methodists, but by 1800 that will have completely changed. Uh, you will have a small number of sort of proto-American revolutionaries from the 1750s and 60s who are beginning to question slavery in the context of thinking about liberty. This changes quite rapidly after the Seven Years' War, or the French and Indian War, as it's sometimes called. Uh, and from 1763 until the revolution in 1775, there's a sea change in American values. And that includes some changes in slavery, including a fairly active movement among slaves in some northern colonies to demand their own freedom. So that by the 1770s, you have slaves in Massachusetts who are petitioning the Massachusetts General Court, which is actually a legislature. So when you read General Court in Massachusetts, it's not a courtroom, it's the legislature. The Massachusetts legislature, they're petitioning the legislature for freedom. And so by the eve of the American Revolution, slavery is weakening for a combination of ideological and religious views in some northern states. This does not mean that it's illegal anywhere, because it isn't. And it does not mean that there aren't a number of northerners uh, who are happy to have slaves. Why do you have slaves? Because slaves are economically very useful. If you imagine what the world was like before there is electricity, indoor plumbing, running water, refrigeration, and all the other conveniences that we live in, you realize that running an urban household requires a vast amount of labor. As late as 1900, the second largest job category in the US Census is household servant. First largest job category is farm labor. That all changes in part because of mechanization. And so, so that if you are Ben Franklin living in Philadelphia, you own a handful of slaves because somebody's got to do all the dirty work in the house. Uh, 
And so there are lots of urban slave owners in Boston, in New York, in Philadelphia, in Providence, Rhode Island, in Hartford, Connecticut, in New Haven, Connecticut, in small towns and big cities. There are also northern farmers up the Hudson Valley. There are slaves in, uh, again, descendants of Dutch slave owners. Uh, there are slaves in New Jersey uh, doing farming in New Jersey. Uh, there are slaves on Long Island doing farming. Uh, Brooklyn, which is, that is basically farmland, has a fair number of slaves as well. So there are slaves in agriculture. There are also slaves in urban professions. If you have a, a wharf in one of the port cities, it's easier to have slaves doing the heavy lifting than to hire free white labor to do it. But there's increasingly free blacks as well. Um, when the revolution begins, there are hundreds of black soldiers in various New England militias. Uh, and in fact, when George Washington takes command of the American army at, uh, at Cambridge in 1775, he looks out among his troops and he sees hundreds of black faces and he completely flips out. Uh, because there's nothing scarier for a white slave owner than black men with guns and bayonets. <laughs> and it's just really scary for George to see this. And he calls a meeting of his generals, all the New England generals, and he says, why are they in my army? And the all New England generals say the same thing. They are our neighbors. They are members of our militia. They vote. They own land. They are citizens of our states, or our colonies, because they still call them colonies. And so Washington lets it go. He then asks Congress to ban the reenlistment of blacks. He then changes his mind about a year later. And by the end of the revolution, about a third of Washington's army are slaves, or are former slaves, free blacks. Uh, many of them, in fact, were, uh, were recently slaves who are emancipated so they can join the army. Uh, and by the end of the war, Washington's most dependable unit, his favorite regiment, is the first Rhode Island, which is 50% black, and uh, most of the blacks in the first Rhode Island had been slaves when the war began. So Washington completely changes his view of black people and ultimately reaches the conclusion that he has to free his slaves and slavery is wrong. So, so the revolution changes people's ideas. Um, those soldiers, those political leaders who come out of the revolution have a very different view of slavery than those who don't. So people like Alexander Hamilton, uh, who you know, probably didn't think very much about slavery one way or the other, ends his military career as a member of the New York Manumission Society. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, John Lorenz in South Carolina, who's Hamilton's uh, tent mate, uh, becomes an abolitionist during the war, even though he owns hundreds and hundreds of slaves. So that, that's the, that's, or his family does it, mostly they're his partners, but he's good on it. So that's the change that goes on. Now, the government of the country under the Articles of Confederation, every state has one vote in Congress, and the states are required to supply both soldiers to the army and tax dollars to the, to the government. These allocations of soldiers and taxes are based on population. And so very early on in the war, there was a debate in Congress about whether or not you count slaves for these allocations. And at this meeting, the Southerners say, you cannot count our slaves because they're property, they're not people, and therefore you can't count them for either military allocation or, uh, or, or for taxing. And he said, it would no more be proper to count the sheep of New Hampshire than the slaves of South Carolina for determining how much money New Hampshire should give the national government. To which Ben Franklin says, well, there's a material difference. Uh, the sheep of New Hampshire will never make a revolution. Uh, and um, the argument, of course, is that not only are slaves people, but they are a dangerous class of people because they might revolt us against us. And in fact, Thousands of them enjoy the British Army who do precisely that. So at the time the Constitutional Convention begins, every slave owner from the South, every Southern politician is on record as saying, slaves are not people, they are property. And then you get the debate in the, in the Constitutional Convention over representation. And it's very clear the new government is going to have representation based on population. 
And so if you have representation based on population, suddenly all of these southern slave owners have forgotten everything they've ever said about slaves. Because oh, of course they're people. So when you think about the three fifths clause, this is the hardest thing to teach, okay? When you teach the three fifths clause, you need to explain to students that it is not a statement about race. It does not say black people are three fifths of a person. What it says is, is that for the purpose of allocating political power in the new government, we will count slaves on a 60% basis. So to give you a simple example, this is what I put on the board. I don't have the blackboard here, but you can mentally figure it out. I imagine two states which have a million population. I imagine that for every 100,000 people, you get one member of Congress. One state has a million people and half of them are slaves, and the other state has a million people and none of them are slaves. If you count slaves for representation fully, then the slave state gets 10 members of Congress and the free state gets 10 members of Congress. If you count slaves, at, if you do not count slaves at all, then the slave state gets five members of Congress and the free state gets 10. And if you do the three-fifths, then the slave state gets eight members of Congress and the free state gets 10 members. Now, what happens if you free all of these 500,000 slaves? The representation in the slave state goes up, right? So the first irony in the American Civil War is that the traitorous southern states, the people who made war on their own country, get more representation in Congress than they had before the war because now the three-fifths clause does not apply to their black population. And so if you count the population fully, then South Carolina and Georgia and Virginia get more representation in Congress, not less. So the three-fifths clause is a power debate. So in this power debate, when Southerners say, and this is directly to, to, to answer your question, when the when the Southerners say we should count slaves for representation, the Northerners say, wait a minute, they're property. And they flip the argument. They say, if you're going to count slaves for representation, then why can't we count the sheep of New Hampshire for <laughs> representation? Because after all, you can buy and sell slaves, and we can buy and sell sheep. And so that becomes the debate. So from day one of the Constitutional Convention until the last day of the Constitutional Convention, slavery is on the agenda. Slavery is debated throughout the Constitution. And the first big debate is on representation. Now, I'm going to briefly run through much of the rest of the Constitution. So Article 1, Section 2 has a three-fifths clause. Uh, this is, of course, a huge fight within the, within the convention because it's about political power. It's about who has the most votes in the House. Furthermore, when they get around to creating the election of the president, James Madison says the fittest thing, the most appropriate thing, would be for the people at large to elect the president. And then he says that there are two problems with that. One is the difference in the right to vote, because some states have a larger franchise of the other. But that would have been actually, see, if they'd done that, it would have been simple. Every southern state would have had a, uh, every state would have had an incentive to increase the vote because you have more power in electing the president. Said, but the other problem is, we would get no, no votes on the count of our Negroes, as he calls it. So Virginia, which is 40% slave, would not be the biggest state in the country if you're having a popular vote in the president. So what do we come up with? The Electoral College, that, that thing in, which creates a system where the person with the most votes doesn't necessarily win the election. Uh, it happens many times in our country. Uh, and why? Because we have the Electoral College. Why do we have the Electoral College? Because of slavery. Because that's the only way you can factor the slaves into the election of the president. If you go to the crucial election of 1800 between John Adams, who's never owned a slave, and Tommy Jefferson, who owns 200, why does Jefferson win the election? Because of the electors created by counting slaves. Jefferson beats Adams by six electoral votes. Take the slave-created electors away from both candidates, Adams wins the election. And in the debates on the presidential issue, 
one of the North Carolina delegates says in his private notes, he has a little asterisk and he says, the reason why the Virginians are taking this position is because if you can't count the slaves, they won't be able to elect their people as president. So it's all about political power. Does that answer your question? Um, mostly, yeah. I, I was more asking about when the Northerners came back at the argument that the sheep thing. Yes. Yeah. What was the Southern response to that? Is what I oh. really see in the book as much. The Southern response to that is to ignore it. They're not going to get into that debate because they'll lose. So they, don't, they won't debate. The Northerners say it, and the Southerners just kind of blow them off. And basically what the Southerners say is this. If you're going to have population-based representation, you have to figure out how to count slaves. Now, there is a Southern argument which goes like this. That representation does not, in fact, represent people. Representation represents the contributions that a particular political entity, in this case a state, make to the national government. So what they say is, the reason why Virginia should have greater representation is because Virginia pays more taxes than anybody else, and Virginia provides more soldiers for the army than anybody else, because Virginia has a bigger population. And so the argument that Southerners make is that slaves are a key component to the wealth that the southern states contribute to the United States. That is not a, a wrong argument. I mean, that's true. The, the, the economy of the United States is based on slavery to a large extent. Our greatest export product is tobacco, which is a southern product. There isn't any cotton yet. Uh, and so they're saying, look, if you're going to have representation based on the uh, on, on, on population, it has to include that population which is not citizens because they are making an economic contribution. And so the three-fifths number becomes a general kind of understanding, well, slaves produce about three-fifths as much wealth as free people because we know slaves don't work as hard as free people and it costs more to, and it, and it costs more to manage them. Uh, by the way, there are some very good economists show that that might be true. Because in 1870, the average free black farmer in the South produces about 40% more cotton than the average free black, than the average slave, adult male slave produced in 1860. That is, that is what we find is is free black workers actually up the, the cotton production because they work harder. You had a question? Yeah. Uh Okay, um, I will be happy to do two things. One is to explain it now. The other thing is I'm happy to send you an article in, in which I lay out all the information. Look, basically, and this is again why an institute like this is so important, American academics, historians, political scientists are very, very uncomfortable with slavery. Uh, Rick Beeman is a friend of mine, a good scholar. Uh, I, got into the, I got into the discussion of slavery in the Constitution because in 1986, Rick, the author of Play Man, was editing a book called Beyond Confederation. Beyond Confederation was a collection of essays on how we got the Constitution. They got the entire book written, and then somebody noticed that the word slave did not appear in the book. They have nothing on slavery. And Rick called me up and said, could you write a book chapter for me on slavery at the Constitutional Convention? And so I wrote a book, a, a book chapter, which was called Making a Covenant with Death, which is uh, based, on, based on William Lloyd Garrison's famous statement that the Constitution is a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. And I wrote this chapter. Uh, and I then later published this chapter as the first chapter of my own book, Slavery, Slavery and the Founders. And uh, 
in, when you read in, in, um, in this understanding of American slavery, you'll read a lot about that comes really out of that chapter. My chapter is coming out of that. So the answer is this. That the reason that you never got the information on slavery in the electoral college is because political scientists do not ever want to talk about slavery. They hate slavery. It interferes with all of their theoretical models of the world. And uh, they don't want to face slavery. And furthermore, many political scientists who write about the Constitution are so in love with the founders, they embrace them in so many ways that they can't possibly wrap their head around the idea that these guys are slave owners. And that maybe there's something kind of yucky about owning slaves, kind of creepy. They don't want to deal with it. Um, I mean, Rob was talking about my, my, my most recent book, um, in, which is in this one, Supreme Injustice. So when I started writing this book, I was writing a chapter on John Marshall and slavery. And every single biography of John Marshall, who is the sort of the youngest of the founding generation and the great hero of the Supreme Court, and every law professor loves him, every political science professor loves him, the, the great ju Chief Justice, you, you begin to think that the great is his first name, and Chief Justice is his middle name, and Marshall is his last name. The great Chief Justice Marshall. Uh, every single biographer, with one exception, says that Marshall owned a dozen or so slaves in Richmond. One biographer said he owned no slaves at all, which is just, you know, like, what planet was he on? Because we all know he had a dozen slaves in Richmond. Well, including, by the way, a biography written by a man named Chuck Hobson, who used to be my friend. I'm not sure if you could talk to Chuck Hobson, who is the editor of the John Marshall Papers, that is, the 12 volumes all about this thing, of the writings and letters and personal papers of John Marshall, with annotations and footnotes, I rely on it heavily. So in the John Marshall Papers, there are three versions of John Marshall's will. All right? Chuck Hobson edited these wills. He has annotations for them. Chuck Hobson writes in his own biography of Marshall, Marshall owns a dozen slaves in Richmond. His will says, I give to my wife my slaves in Richmond, and he names them all. Gives, he names 15, and then he says, and the children of so-and-so, so maybe it's 18. Well, you know, I'm not gonna, nobody's going to score any points in the difference between about a dozen and 18. I mean, that, that's kind of close, right? The next two paragraphs later, he says, I give to my nephew my plantation at Chickahominy. Now, everybody who studies the South understands a plantation is a farm with a minimum of 20 slaves. And John Marshall, who is a very modest man, never brags about his wealth, would never claim to have a plantation if he didn't own at least 20 slaves. So he says, I give to my nephew my plantation at Chickahominy with all the equipment, animals, buildings, and slaves. So when I read this, I say, well, it's got to be more than a dozen, because he's just mentioned a dozen, and now they're slaves in Chickahominy. Two paragraphs later, I give to my son Edward the land he lives on in Fauquier County, which is way, about 100 miles west of Richmond, with the usual number of slaves on the land. Well, what's the usual number of slaves? <laughs> and then the next paragraph in his first will is, I was going to give my land buildings, animals, and the usual number of slaves to my son John, but because of his embarrassments, John's a drunk and he's always going into debt. And so John Marshall says, uh, I'm going to put all of that in trust for my son's wife and children, that is his daughter-in-law and grandchildren. So now I got the slave at Chickahominy, the slaves for son Edward, the slave that son John won't, the later version of the will, John gets the, the slave. And in the next version of it, so this is 1827, the 1831 will, he says, um, I give my land to my son Edward, the slaves having already been conveyed. That means he's already given to the slaves. So I can go to the US Census. Edward Marshall owns 27 slaves. Edward Marshall is 25 years old in 1831. He did not buy 27 slaves. That's a 
in today's market, you know, that's four or five million dollars, right? He did not buy these things. These are the slaves Daddy gave him. So clearly, he's got a dozen slaves in Richmond, plus the other six that he didn't count, plus the 27 that he gave Edward. We also find in the 1837 where John's living, in the 1831 census, where John is living. And there are like 38 slaves on the land. We also discover that John Marshall has another son, uh, uh, Jacqueline Marshall, who is a, uh, uh, a, um, a physician, but doesn't really have a medical practice. He's basically described as a kind of a, uh, a gentleman farmer. He, he doesn't do much of anything in case he runs for office. Uh, I think he sits on his veranda and drinks milk jewels. <laughs> um, Jacqueline Marshall in 1830 owns 47 slaves. And then we get to Chickahominy. And we find that in 1830, the census has 65 slaves in Chickahominy. Uh, you guys do the math. 65 and 27 and 38 and the 47 he gave to, to Jacqueline, it begins to add up to some pretty big numbers. Uh, I sent information on just the 65 slaves in Chickahominy to my friend Chuck Hobson, and I said, uh, I, I wrote up a couple of paragraphs and said, I just discovered this, what do you think? Because I'm actually questioning my own research skills at this point. <laughs> I, I, I'm thinking, you know, come on, how could everybody be wrong, wrong and I be right? And so Chuck writes back an email and he says, I was so interested in what you wrote that I went to ancestry.com to see for myself. Which is another way of saying I don't trust you. Right? <laughs> and he says, you're wrong about 65 slaves at Chickahominy because you counted the overseer and his wife in trial. There's only 62. <laughs> okay, so I'm wrong by three and he's wrong by 62. Who's closer to reality right now? Why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all this because this is an example of how my profession historians and how political scientists have run from slavery. They don't want to deal with it. I, I mean, in the case of John Marshall, Chuck edited three different versions of these wills, and it never dawned on him that maybe he ought to look and see what the numbers are. It never dawned on him that he ought to go to the census and actually see what's there, go to the tax records and see what's there. In addition to this, we find that John Marshall kept detailed personal records of everything he buys and sells. He buys and sells for like the, we have the books from the early 1880s, the early, I'm sorry, the early 1780s until 1797 when he goes to France uh, as, a, as an American on the way to France. And he has no more personal business records because he burned them all. I think he burned them all because he did not want some snob historian like me coming in and pointing out that he's buying and selling human beings his whole life. All right? But in these years that we have, from the 1780s until the late 1790s, Marshall buys about 15 slaves just in his career alone. At this point, he is married without children. He is living in Richmond. And he has absolutely no need for a dozen slaves in Richmond. But he has already bought the land that becomes the Chickahominy Plantation. And he's already buying slaves and sending them out to Chickahominy to work his plantation. Uh, ironically, uh, this is the kind of thing that, you know, as a historian, you just kind of salivate that you found. There are two uh, diary entries for July 4th. One July 4th, 1784, which is the first anniversary of independence uh, since the British signed the treaty. And the second is July 4th, uh, uh, 1787, which is when the convention is written. On July 4th, both July 4th, John Marshall celebrates Independence Day by buying slaves. <laughs> uh, that's what America's all about. But you didn't learn that. What you learned is that the Electoral College was there because the framers didn't trust the voters. All right. Now, Let's all think about that. Who is who are at who are these plain honest men? 
What have they done their whole lives? They're professional politicians. They've been in office their whole life. Thomas Jefferson, who's not a big legend, is elected to the Virginia Provincial Assembly in 1772, and except for one year when he's mourning the death of his wife, he is eating at the public trough as a public official from 1772 till 1809 when he leaves the presidency. He is never not in public office. He is never not collecting a public salary. James Madison begins his career in the 1770s, and he is eating at the public trough until 1817 when he leaves the president. He is never out of public office. Roger Sherman, who is better than all of them, he, he is elected in the 1750s, and he is in public office until he dies in the 1790s. He signs everything. He's there at every one of these important events. If you look at these plain honest men, they are elected politicians. So I, the question I would ask you is, why would people who get elected every time they run for office be afraid of the voters? They love the voters. The voters keep them in their salary jobs. They're not afraid of the voters. There is one guy at the convention who complains about the voters. Eldridge Jerry, who of course creates a very Jerry man, right? And Eldridge Jerry complains about the voters because in Massachusetts, every adult male can vote without regard to race, religion, uh, uh, or, or economic status. So Jerry complains about the voters, and everybody else ignores it. And who doesn't sign the Constitution? Eldridge Jerry. <laughs> So, so, so the, this argument that, that the, they're afraid of the voters, there is not a single shred of evidence for this. Furthermore, who are the voters at this time? Except, if, well, what not, you for you? in Massachusetts, black men and Indians. Okay, so in 1787, the convent, Constitution is sent for ratification. Black men vote in six states in 1787. Okay, they vote in Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, um, New Hampshire, and North Carolina. Okay, so it is not just white men, but it, what it is, it's property men in some states, it's adult males in other states, it's people who have some stake in society. For example, in, in New York, which is a great seaport in Philadelphia, the See, the sailors can't vote because they don't own property. And they're the lowest class of people, by the way. The lowest class in America outside of slaves are, are sailors because it's such a terrible job to be out at sea all this time. So they're disfranchised. But no, the voters are an elite. You, your instinct was right. Who votes is the elite, right? But, but blacks can vote in six states, and that's important for when we think about the Constitution. Um, so why would they be afraid of the voters and are not afraid of them? What they are doing is allocating a way to count slaves in the election of the president. And it's crystal clear from the debate in the convention. Madison says the best thing would be for the people to elect, and then he says, but I got a better idea, the electoral college. All right, let me, uh, let, me, let me move forward. The other great debate over slavery is the African slave trade. And this is a weird debate because the convention agrees, more or less, that the national government should be able to regulate foreign commerce. Commerce among the several states, which is today we call interstate commerce, and commerce with foreign nations. In this debate, the South Carolina delegation gets up and rants that you have to protect the slave trade. Nobody has mentioned the slave trade. And the reason nobody has mentioned the slave trade is because nobody wants to talk about slavery if they don't have to. And during, at the very beginning of the revolution, every single one of the newly independent or claiming to be independent states prohibits the importation of Africans to their states. So there's no African slave trade going on in 1787. They all ban the slave trade because the slave trade is basically run by the British. So you don't import British goods. Slaves are British goods. Okay? 
there are very, very few American slave traders. Very few Americans go to Africa. Uh, it's a very expensive, very risky proposition with the possibility of making huge profits. And most of the African slave trade is not into the United States. It is into the British Caribbean and Latin America. Of the, uh, of the 12 and a half million slaves who are brought from Africa to the New World, fewer than 900,000 come to what is the United States to drop in the bucket. Seven million go to Brazil. All right, then. So, so Americans are not involved in the African slave trade. They ban the slave trade. And there are no active importations of slaves in 1787. But South Carolina is fearful that if the convention has the power to ban, to regulate all foreign commerce, Congress has the power to ban, regulate all foreign economy, commerce, it will ban the African trade. So the South Carolinians demand a, a clause, which is Article 1, Section 9, to prevent Congress from banning the African slave trade. And the clause is, of course, obscurely written. The migration or importation of such persons, not the language, migration is immigrants, importation of slaves. The migration and importations of such persons as the states now existing shall be proper to admit shall not be prohibited before the year 1808. So that's the slave trade clause. It is vigorously debated. A number of northerners oppose it. The Virginia delegation opposes it. The Maryland delegation opposes it on the floor, but then votes for it as a concession to South Carolina. Delaware opposes it. Pennsylvania, New Jersey oppose it. But it passes. And so what it does is to give South Carolina and Georgia and any other state that wants it 20 years to import African slaves. And uh, no slaves will be imported until 1803. So even as they demand the African slave trade clause, they don't do anything about it until 1803. Why 1803? What else happened in 1803? Pardon? Louisiana Purchase. Why does that change the slave trade? Because you got all that cotton land, which by then is the important thing. And so South Carolina reopens the slave trade, and for five years, uh, somewhere between 40 and 50,000 slaves are brought into the, to the U.S. in five years. It's the largest importation into what is the U U.S. in the history of, uh, of the country. Were those American No, because while Congress can't ban the trade, Congress does prohibit American citizens from being involved in the trade. So, any, so no American ships, no American sailors, no American investors can be involved in the trade. Uh, even while they are coming in, so it's all foreign ships. Uh, Congress is saying Americans will not go and do this, uh, and, 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 and severe punishments if you are if you're caught. There is so there's some illegal American trading, but it's relatively small because Congress won't let them do it. So that's the African trade. In the rest of the Constitution, we have the following provisions. We have uh, three clauses dealing with taxation, saying that the three-fifths clause will be applied to uh, the taxation, that there's taxation based on population. This is simply to protect the South so they don't have to pay full cost for, for their slaves in taxation. Um, there are two clauses that deal with domestic insurrections. There's one in Article 1, Section 8, and there's one in Article 4. Uh, now, all of you probably in your textbooks read this and get Shay's Rebellion, right? They're worried about Shay's Rebellion. The Southern delegates go back to their ratifying conventions and they say, we have a promise that the national government will suppress slave rebellions. This is a good thing. The slave ins the insurrection clauses. The word insurrection means only one thing to a slave owner, and it isn't farmers complaining about taxes. Uh, there are two clauses prohibiting export taxes. Export taxes, of course, are taxes on exports. Why do you ban export taxes? Because the Southerners insist on a ban on export taxes because they are afraid that either the national government or the states, like New York or Pennsylvania, with large seaports, will put a tax on Virginia tobacco going overseas, and that will hurt slavery. So 
So there are two clauses in the Constitution, three clauses in the Constitution from slavery that we still live with. One is the Electoral College, and the other are the two bans on export taxes. Now you might say, well, why would, why would a country tax exports? Because that only hurts the economy of the exporting country, right? But in fact, that's not true, because if you have a product that the rest of the world wants, taxing it isn't going to stop the rest of the world from having it. When we buy oil from Saudi Arabia, we pay the Saudi Arabian government an export tax. Uh, and uh, when, you did, when you drill oil in Texas and you put it in a barrel, you pay the state of Texas, not an export tax, but a, but a, but a drilling tax which is the same thing as an export thing. So Texas artificially raises the cost of oil and takes some of it from the state of Texas. Uh, every, every oil exporting country has an export tax, or most of them do, because it's a way of getting money from people, extra money from people who don't have oil wells. Um, we can easily imagine export taxes on all kinds of things that the United States has produced, or not, which other countries could produce, or is produced as well. If you imagine, for example, silicon chips for computers, which the United States produces cheaper than anywhere else in the world, the US could put up 50 cent tax on every computer chip coming out of the US, and they would still be cheaper than other people's chips, and the treasury would make a lot of money. Can't do it. Yes? Isn't that kind of what China is trying to do to us right now as far as um, retaliation for the, the import tariffs? No, they're putting import taxes on our goods, which is different. Okay. So, for example, uh, they're putting here? a tax on like, pistachios and, and yeah. anybody here from Iowa? Iowa? Where? Yeah. Um, on the yeah. Okay. What's Iowa's great contribution to the world? Soybean. Vacant. Uh, yeah, right? <laughs> That's not. Soybeans that are right? And Iowa farmers are going to get hammered by China because China imports massive amounts of American pork. They import massive amounts of Alaska salmon. And China has just put import taxes on that. That's an import tax. Right. Okay. Just like the president has put an import tax on, on Canadian steel and Canadian aluminum. But essentially it serves the same purpose. Right? But, but, but it's the reverse. Right. In other words, an import tax raises the price of an imported good, right. which means that the domestic producer can raise their yeah. prices and make more money. Right. In other words, if you have a steel mill, you love President Trump because he is now making foreign steel so much more expensive that the American steel makers can raise the price of steel and still be below the imported price and therefore sell all the steel they can make. So that, if you make nails, you can put If your nails, you got screwed. If okay. you buy a <laughs> all of us, all of us, all of us can buy a car that just got screwed because we're going to have to pay more for the steel that went into that car. Yes? Five minutes. Before we go too far into the the oh, okay. <laughs> well, no, but I'm, tr I'm trying to get you to understand what the issues are. Okay, so the other provisions of the Constitution are the Fugitive Slave Clause, which is not debated in the floor. It simply passes without any debate because nobody imagines that it's going to be the big issue for slavery is going to be the Fugitive Slave Clause because there are so few, few fugitive slaves. It's not easy to get from Virginia to a free state because, um, oh, I should have added, during the revolution, Massachusetts and New Hampshire end slavery outright, abolish it. Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and Connecticut pass what are called gradual abolition acts, which say that the children of slave women will be born free, which means slavery will literally die out. Uh, but in 1787, the only two actual free states where there are no slaves are New Hampshire and Massachusetts. It's very hard for a slave to run from Virginia to New Hampshire before yeah. there are railroads or steamboats. So the Fugitive Slave Clause is not seen as a big deal at the time. Um, probably the most important pro-slavery provision of the Constitution is the amendment process. The amendment process requires that 
in order to amend the Constitution, three quarters of the states must approve a constitutional amendment. In, 1760, in 1860, there are 15 slave states. If there were 15 slave states, how many free states do you, you need to pass an amendment that is slavery? It's a simple algebra thing, right? <laughs> you need four, yeah, at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know who you are, but I love you. <laughs> okay, so you need 15, you need 45 free states, right? What year did you say? 1860. 1860. You need 45 free states, which means you need a country of 60 states. So to this day, in 2018, it would be impossible to end slavery by a constitutional amendment if all 15 slave states still existed. Uh, okay, why do you need the Supreme Court to end segregation? Because in 1954, there are 17 states which require mandatory segregation everywhere, and Kansas allows segregation in some parts. So that if you had 17 states banning refusing to support an amendment to end segregation, you can't end segregation. So what the Constitution does is literally to protect slavery forever. Wow. And when the slave owners go back to their states to, for ratification, to tell the state ratifying conventions, we have achieved an enormous victory for slavery. We have representation in Congress, we have the electoral college, we have the fugitive slave law, we have the militia coming down to suppress slave rebellions, and Congress has limited powers and has no power to regulate slavery in the states and no power to end slavery, and you could never do it by constitutional amendment. And so that is what the Constitution in essence does. It then of course leads to various kinds of cases, various kinds of litigation, some involving fugitive slaves, some involving the right of Congress to regulate slavery in the federal territories. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that tomorrow if you want. But one thing to think about is this. In the Dred Scott decision, Chief Justice Tawney says that free black people can never be citizens of the United States. And so, Dred Scott cannot sue in federal court as a citizen in Missouri because even if he were a voting citizen in Missouri, which he's not, he can't be a citizen of the United States. The problem with that, and this is why I, I pushed back to you when you said, you know, white men voting. The ratification of the Constitution is made possible in part by the votes of black men in six states. So if black men are are voting to ratify the Constitution, then surely black men are citizens of the United States, because how could you be a citizen of the United, not be a citizen of the United States and be part of the ratification process? Furthermore, from 1788 when the Constitution was ratified until 1861 when the Civil War began, black men vote in various numbers of states, depending on what year it is, for members of the House of Representatives, and for members of the state legislatures which choose US senators, and for presidential electors. So here is the weird thing. Under the Dred Scott decision, Chief Justice Tawney is essentially saying that it is permissible for people who are not citizens in the United States to vote in federal and state <laughs> elections, because Blacks vote in all of the New England states at this time except Connecticut. They vote in New York under some circumstances. They vote in Michigan under some circumstances. And they have held public office in a number of states. So we have this weird result of the Supreme Court saying that they're not citizens, but at the same time acknowledging that because voting is regulated by the states, they are still able to vote. Now, I have to tell you, after the Civil War, immigrants who are not citizens are allowed to vote in many states because we have not always made citizenship a prerequisite for voting. And so throughout the Midwest, 
immigrants vote in large numbers in Ohio, and in Indiana, and in Illinois, and Michigan, uh, in Minnesota, uh, in the Dakotas, uh, in Nebraska. Because these states say, well, if you are an immigrant and you have declared, you know, in order to become a citizen, you have to be here seven years. If you have been here four years and you've declared your intention to be a citizen, that's enough for you to vote. So these are things to think about as you try to connect the past and the present. Am I out of time? You're doing fine. Over close, yeah. What's your 35? And then now we're done for the day? Yeah. Oh, okay. So then we go to drinking, right? Uh, any other any questions? I, I mean I haven't done as much, I haven't covered as much as I wanted. The cameraman's got a question. Yeah, yeah I, I do. Is there a book uh, that you recommend where you lay the, all this out uh, in a way that I can uh, how do you say yeah, so, digest so, it? So <laughs> if, if you wanna if you wanna see it all laid out in terms of the constitution. My book, Slavery and the Founders, which is in paperback. It's a third edition, uh, published by Routledge. Uh, not only lays out all the constitutional stuff, but lays out all the stuff about Master Tom. Uh, uh, I, of course, want to go to Charlottesville and sell T-shirts, which will have a picture of Tom and a, a, a good-looking woman of mixed race. We'll say Charlottesville, where Tommy met Sally. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, that, might, that might cause a different kind of uh, revolution in Charlottesville. <laughs> there was another question, yeah. You said that um, this falls in the United States. Yeah. So, when might I know if you come across this period of the world? When did color become synonymous with slavery? Okay. That's, a, that's the jackpot question for you. For the whole two weeks, right? When did color become synonymous with slavery? The answer is this: when, when the, the British, okay, I just got to go. Can we go over ten minutes? Do I have your permission to keep going? Yeah, please do. Yeah. All right, all right, good. Uh, so when the British get here, there is no slavery in England, and in fact, England is the only place in Europe where there is no slavery, and there have not been slavery for a very, very long time. The British get rid of slavery shortly after the Romans leave. Uh, slavery lingers in Ireland for a few hundred years longer, and it's gone. Uh, St. Patrick, for example, was born a slave in Ireland. Um, but slavery is gone. And if you think about the great English song, Rule Britannia, Britain, What's the, what are the words? Anybody here got a good singing voice? Rule Britannia rules the waves. Yeah. Englishmen will never be slaves. Ah. And that is the motto of England. That we are a slave-free society. When the English come to the New World, they actually see themselves as liberators. who are going to liberate the Indians and the blacks from Spanish tyranny and Spanish slavery. And the first Englishmen to come to the New World before the settlement are people who are either pirates or national heroes, depending on how you look at them, like John Hawkins, who is wanted for piracy by the Spanish, but becomes Sir John Hawkins under Queen Elizabeth, and Francis Drake, who becomes Sir Francis Drake. And what the Hawkins and Drake do, they raid Spanish Caribbean islands, they rip off the treasure trip ships that are bringing gold and silver out of the New World of Spain. And in the process, they fill their ships with slaves who become free black sailors. So by the time of the Jamestown settlement, there are hundreds, not thousands, but hundreds of black men serving on British ships in, at, sailing out of England. And England considers itself to be a country where it is going to liberate the New World. The problem for the English is that they don't land in the Caribbean. They land in, first in North Carolina at Roanoke, and then in Virginia. And the Pahan Indians don't need to be freed from the Spanish because there aren't any Spanish. So, so instead, the English end up in just brutal, nasty, vicious, murderous warfare with the natives in Virginia. <laughs>
But England has no slavery, and there's no slavery in America. And in 1619, we have the record of the first blacks coming to Virginia. They're probably actually not the first blacks coming to Virginia, but the, the first record of them. Uh, I, by the way, think it's a, always a kind of a stupid thing to worry about who's the first black to come to America. Uh, you know, uh, you know, who's the first Italian to come to America? Who's the first? Year? It doesn't matter who the first is. What matters are who are the first ones who had an impact on society. For, for example, there are many Europeans who reached the New World before Columbus. Why does Columbus matter? Because he's the first one to come back and talk about it. The, 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 I mean, the Scandinavian, Cliff Erickson, is, 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 in, is in Canada. But he doesn't come back and say, hey, I found the New World. He just says, I went to this place and, and you know, traded and got some stuff and came home. So it's what you do with it that matters, not that you're the first, all right? So the British come to North America, and initially they discover that they're, they don't know where they are. They don't know what they're doing. They mostly starve to death. Uh, in the first 15 years of, of British settlement of, of of Virginia, uh, the most likely thing for anybody who arrived there is to die. Uh, in, in 1609, they are completely out of food, and it's known as the starving time. Uh, perhaps as many as 70% as of the population dies. It is one of the few examples of, of, of um, cannibalism in American history where, where Virginians are digging up dead bodies and eating them. Uh, there's one Virginian who murders his wife and actually salts down the body so that he can he can live off his wife because they're starving to death. Um, and they have no economic model to, to do, and they don't know what they're doing. And then in 1617, they begin to grow tobacco. And everything changes. Because uh, tobacco is a real product uh, and it's going to make money. And this is the first beginning of, of, the, of you know, uh, the drug history of America. Right? You, can, you, you, can actually, you can actually do the entire history of the new world based on things that are bad for you. So <laughs> what, what stimulates the great African slave trade? Sugar. Not really good for you. So, and then, and it makes rum, right? And then, of course, you have coffee, and all that caffeine and jitters, and then you have tobacco, and then you have uh, marijuana, which is now becoming legal everywhere, and so we'll have a new drug trade. Uh, so, you know, you could do the whole history of the Americas as, as, as the history of, of, uh, of bad stuff. Uh, but in any event, what tobacco does is stimulate a huge economic boom in Virginia, where the, a man's prosperity is determined by how much labor he has. Land is infinite. You can have as much land as you want. What you need is labor. And so for the next 40 or 50 years, the vast amount of labor is white labor from England. Poor people brought over as indentured servants, worked to death often, brutally mistreated, beaten. Uh, but some of them become free, and then some of them become landholders, and some of them then become owners of other indentured servants. Um, women who come to Virginia at this time from England, uh, if they survive, tend to do very, very well because of the vast shortage of, of English women and there aren't enough Indian women to go around. And so uh, there are women who literally, their profession is being married. So they marry some guy, he dies two years later, she inherits his farm, she can now marry a richer guy. He dies, she can now marry a richer guy. Uh, in 1619, the uh, Virginia company uh, sends a few hundreds of prostitutes from England to the New World to marry the men who are working in the New World. I, well, I taught in Virginia for a number of years, and I would always run into these people, my family came before 1630, and I said, you yeah, check into the status of one of the <laughs> <laughs> uh, Or what did they eat in 1609? <laughs> so in any event, the first blacks from 1619. They are treated as indentured servants. They are not treated as slaves. And at least one of them is free by 1622. A number of them are freed later on. Uh, one of them, a man named Anthony Johnson, who becomes Anthony Johnson. He's something else when he arrives. He becomes Anthony Johnson. He ends up owning 100 acres of land 
and a few slaves from Africa in, by the 1650s. That is, he is, is you know, an American who managed to, he's an African immigrant who managed to transition to be a uh, prosperous American. Um, and we have truly no slavery in Virginia until the early 1630s when we begin to find wills where people put in their will, I give my African servant to my son for the rest of his life. Now what is going on here is the ability of Virginians to exploit the fact that Africans don't speak English, they don't know what the laws of England are, they don't know what the rules are, and so they are kept as slaves for life. But most of them are not. Most of the blacks in Virginia by 1640 are free. There are probably fewer than 500 Africans in the New World in, in Virginia at this time. By 1660, there are probably fewer than 1,000 in the New World. However, in 1660, Virginia begins to pass laws creating slavery, acknowledging the existence of slavery, and then it simply takes off. And so slavery becomes a legal system, and this is important to understand, that anybody can be enslaved at any time. You know? um, anyone in this room could be kidnapped tomorrow, banged on the head, locked up, taken to some remote part of Georgia, and be forced to pick uh, peanuts or cotton or whatever you grow in Georgia today. Uh, in, in, in a rural area, there are people who are held in illegal bondage, in illegal working conditions in, in central Florida in order to These people are treated as slaves, but that does not create a system of slavery. That creates what today we would call illegal human trafficking and illegal kidnapping. Slavery requires a system, it requires laws, it requires police enforcement, it requires a judges to say, oh, you've inherited three slaves from your dad. It, re it requires the public commodification of people as property. That occurs in the 1660s and moves forward very rapidly. As that occurs, and at the same time, the British begin to move away from white indentured servitude, although there are still white indentured servants in the colonies until the revolution. But as the white indentured servants begin to decline rapidly, and blacks from Africa begin to come, the association is made between skin color and status. However, initially, it is not about skin color. Initially, it is about religion. So the early laws, for instance, talk about Christians holding non-Christians, because Africans are perceived as being non-Christian, and therefore enslaved, because you can enslave the heathen. Uh, the problem with that is, is that uh, the Church of England is trying to baptize its people. And so, far, and so in the 1660s, Virginia passes a law saying baptism does not lead to freedom. And then you can baptize your slaves, which is really good because it's easier to exploit slaves if they're, if they're told from birth that if you're a good slave, you'll go to heaven. And remember, who's more likely to go to heaven, a good slave or a good master? Why? Because they don't think they were supposed to. A master is a lot of people. It is easier to get the camel through the eye of the needle than it is to get a rich man into heaven, right? And the eye of the needle, of course, are these weirdly shaped things on the walls of, of, of Middle Eastern cities. And, and the needle was about this high. And what would happen is you'd have to get a camel to get on its knees and walk on its knees into the town because there weren't gates. This was to protect the invaders from knocking down the gates and running in. So it's easier to get the camel through the eye of the needle than it is to get a rich man in heaven. So you get, starting by the 1700s, 200 and, uh, 160 years of, of, of white Protestant ministers telling slaves, you know, just be good slaves and you'll go to heaven. Yeah, it's tough now, but God's heaven is waiting for you. Be good slaves. Um, so, 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 they, so they use religion as a tool to enslave, to enslave, to keep enslaving. And as that happens, 
then race becomes the surrogate default for slave. In the early period, before, say, 1720, it's a combination of race and social understandings. So, for example, if you are a black who came to America in 1660, and by 1690, you speak perfectly good English, and you run away, you are far more likely to be able to run away than somebody who's just fresh off the boat from Africa. Because you say, well, I'm not a slave. I'm an Englishman. Just like you. I'm just black. You know, I speak English. I, I do English things. Uh, I, I'll give you one quick example of this, because it's it, it very helpful. In, in um, 1839, or 18, 1838, a friend of Douglas escapes from Maryland. He escapes from Maryland by dressing up as a sailor and borrowing what's called a seaman's protection, which is a seam, which is a identification papers for merchant seamen from a black. And he gets on a train, and the, the ticket collector comes, and he purposely doesn't buy a ticket at the window because he might get questions. He's waiting until he gets on the train, buys it. And the, and the ticket collector comes to Douglas and says, before he says, where's your ticket, he says, I assume you have your free papers. And Douglas says, very boldly, I never take my free papers to sea. I have something better. I have something with the American Eagle on it. And he pulls out the Siemens Protection, which is an official government document. It also said that he's five foot six. Douglas is not six feet. So fortunately, <laughs> the guy didn't actually read it. But the reason Douglas can get away with this is because Douglas is effectively raised inside the household of a very wealthy Maryland planter. And Douglas speaks what would be considered perfect standard English at the time. He doesn't talk like a plantation slave. He talks like a man who speaks English. You don't also read and write. And he's also been working on the docks for four or five years, so he can talk like a sailor, you know. You know, kids have this, you know, national talk like a pirate day. So this is talk like a sailor day, right? So he can talk like a sailor. And I am sure that the ticket collector looks at Frederick Douglass and makes the immediate snap judgment, incorrect but more or less logical, that this is a free black from the north because he's never met a black from Maryland who speaks like this, who speaks with authority, who's comfortable around white people and has his paper. He buys his ticket and he goes to New York. So, so when the Africans are coming, American-born blacks or people who come young and learn to speak like other Virginians are much more able to run away and be free. And they run away as individuals. You know, I'm a, I'm a free black man. I'm not a slave. And, and there's a, a free black population in Virginia from then until the Civil War, uh, but it's relatively small and it's always under pressure. By the 1720s, anywhere in America, blackness becomes a presumption slave. And it's up to the African American to prove that they are not a slave. I, I want to take one more minute if I can. I know you're stare, staring at me like that. But I need to put this into I want to, one quick story in one of the historical context. The quick story is this is there's a wonderful story uh, of a immigration official who stopped three Hispanic men in LA. This is a true story, actually. He stopped these three Hispanic men in LA, and he starts asking them questions. And the two of them are undocumented aliens who recently got to the US and only speak Spanish. And he and they, 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 um, he asks them a couple of questions in English, and they don't answer. And the third guy immediately answers for them and says, oh yeah, they, they just came over. And, uh, and he speaks perfectly good LA English. And the immigration officer take these two people. And the third guy, who's also an undocumented alien, gets away because he's faking it because he can speak LA English. Uh, so that's, again, the notion of a culturalization. Now, here's the other piece of all this. 
The African slave trade has been going on since the 1450s, when Prince Henry the Navigator circumnavigates Africa and comes back. Before Columbus, he brings African slaves to Europe. There are African slaves in the Azores, the Madeiras, the Canary Islands, in Malta, Sicily, Sardinia, all over the Mediterranean, before Columbus goes. When Columbus goes to the New World, he brings Carib Indians back to Spain and tells Queen Isabella, I found this whole world full of people who can enslave. Uh, and so the first transatlantic slave trade is Indians being brought to the US, Indians being brought to Spain. Uh, eventually, the Indians are, are on the verge of dying out because of status, brutality, and disease. And uh, Spain shifts to African slavery, which Brazil has already been involved with, uh, the Portuguese in Brazil have already been doing. The African slave trade begins by buying Africans on the coast of Africa from individual nations. Every nation in Africa is a slave trading nation, a slave owning nation. People always ask, I always have students say, well, why would other Africans, you know, why would Africans sell each other into slavery? And I say, why would blue-eyed blonde Germans put other blue-eyed blonde Germans in gas chambers and then burn their bodies? Uh, as long as you can conceptualize people as being different from you, you can do unspeakable things to them. Why would, why would Croatians murder Bosnian Muslims? Why would Serbians murder Croatians? Because even though they all speak a language with no vowels and none of us can understand it, and they all look Yugoslavian to us, that to them, they know who the difference is. You know, why would, uh, you know, why would 50 blue-eyed, red-headed guys in, in, in Northern Ireland kill each other because 25 are Catholic and 25 are Protestant? Because they can conceptualize themselves as the other. So Yoruba's enslave houses, houses enslave Igbos, and everybody enslaves their neighbor. But by the late 1500s and the early 1600s, there is a regularized system of enslavement in which the coastal African countries are going deeper and deeper into Africa with surrogates who are then going deeper into Africa to bring Africans from Central Africa to the coast to be sent to the New World. And what you have in Africa is a industrial system of human, where human beings are the industrial product. And this is very, very hard to conceptualize. But, but what you have is a regularized, sophisticated system of business transactions where eventually people from 1,500 miles in the center of Africa end up in the New World being traded from one to another to another to another to the coast to the New World. Okay. And the African slave trade expands very, very dramatically because until the 1640s and 50s, the New World cannot produce as much sugar as Europe can eat. And it's all about sugar, and sugar production is very labor intensive. Slaves die in three to five years. Uh, there's no self-reproducing slave population in the, in the Caribbean or the Latin America. It's all importations. Women don't live long enough or aren't healthy enough to have children because they die and they're overworked. Okay, by 1650, this is where we'll end, <laughs> by 1650, the new world is producing enough sugar to satisfy the European system. And so, by 1650, the price of slaves in the Caribbean and in Brazil begins to decline because the demand for slaves begins to decline because there are fewer new sugar plantations being formed. However, the price of the, the supply of slaves on the west coast of Africa is continuing to expand. Because remember, it's not like you can you know, email somebody and say, I need slaves. It's all very slow. So there are more and more slaves coming to West Africa and the demand in the Caribbean and Venezuela and Brazil is declining. And this is precisely when Virginia and then after 1680, South Carolina get involved in slave trading. Because this is finally the time when the Americans can afford to buy the slaves. Because the Americans could not compete for slaves 
with sugar plantations. Sugar planters can pay more, and furthermore, and this is only looking at a map, and again, this is where you teach a little geography. It's 900 nautical miles from Dakar, Senegal to Recife, Brazil. On a, on a sailing ship, that's a week or less if you've got good winds. So the cost of bringing the slaves from Africa to Brazil is substantially less than bringing them to Jamaica, and infinitely less than bringing them all the way up to Virginia and South Carolina. So what happens is, is the cost of slaves drops in Africa, and nautical technology is improving, and the slave traders are now learning what the optimal time to bring slaves to America is when the winds are right. So all of this coalesces in the creation of a world where Virginians can buy slaves relatively inexpensively. South Carolina, which produces vast quantities of rice, which is very valuable, can now buy as many slaves as they want. And this leads to the huge expansion of slavery uh, in the 1680s and beyond. And that answers your question about when they become seen as, when race becomes the surrogate for enslavement. You want me to stop? Thank you, Sue.